great. Um, <laughs> so uh, should we start over? What I was uh, what I was in the process of telling you guys is that um, Collab Planning, we are the um, planning coordinator firm. Uh, I am based and located in Philly, and uh, you guys have seen me around uh, in the West Ward um, for um, the last six-ish months. I've been going over uh, to the neighborhood. I've been in charge of taking the needs assessment survey. So you probably heard from me or you've seen me around just walking and handing out surveys to everyone that I see. Uh, it is my pleasure to be conducting this meeting. Today is the transportation open space meeting. And uh, before we get started, why don't we do a short round of introductions? Um, we are a small group this morning, but uh, I am really, really curious to hear who do we have on the line today? What brings you in and what are your expected outcomes? So I am gonna start by who I have first on camera, Tanya. Good morning, my name is Tanya Ruiz. I'm Your audio is not working. Oh no, can you hear oh, me? Oh wait, go ahead. Good morning, my name is Tanya Ruiz. I'm the new assistant manager for the Westward Community Initiative. Um, I'm also a Westward resident, I'm excited to be here. And what organization are you joining from? From the Westward Community Initiative. Thank you. Laurie, you're next. And you are on mute. Hi, I'm Laurie Metz. I'm the branch exec from the Y uh, over on Lafayette Street. So happy to be here with everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Miranda. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me through a mask. So uh, yes, no. OK, um, I'm over in my office. Anyway, uh, I'm the community gardens and compost coordinator at GDP uh, for my program, uh, Eastern Garden Works. Um, so I just have a vested interest in town. Um, excited to meet you guys. Uh, get started. Thank you. Great having you. Next, we have our Freeman. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, State Representative Bob Freeman. I represent the Easton area in the uh, Pennsylvania State House of Representatives and very happy to serve on this committee as well as a couple of others. Uh, the West Ward is near and dear to my heart. I grew up in the West Ward on South 10th Street. I actually own the family home, uh, which is three rental units. Uh, my brother lives in one. And uh, even though my wife and I now live on College Hill, I'm very connected to the West Ward and we're to see it succeed as a neighborhood. Um, and I want to also welcome Tanya to the West Ford uh, Community Initiative. Uh, she'll be working very closely with Amy Bacadoro. I think they'll make a dynamic team in the West Ward. So looking forward to working with her as well. Great having you, um, sir. What's the proper way to address you? I've never properly addressed a state representative. Uh, Bob. Bob. Uh, actually works quite well. <laughs> and you know, Bob, <laughs> Bob spelled backwards is? Bob. Yes, I'm my own palindrome, so. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much. And you're right, we're very, very happy to have Tanya join the uh, team with Amy. Bill Strickland, you're next. Uh, hi, I'm Bill. I'm the editorial director of the Hearst Enthusiast Group, uh, which is downtown, which and it includes um, bicycling and runner's world. And so I'm a very big proponent of um, uh, community mobility and urban mobility and um, bike paths and walking paths and just getting more people out. And I think I think one of the reasons Westward really excites me is it's such a walkable um, neighborhood with so much potential to just be really robust in terms of people being out in the community and um, getting to businesses and their homes and schools um, on foot and on bike and on skateboard or whatever. And I'm just so excited about the potential for the West Ward. And yeah, Tanya, it's, it's great um, to have you uh, in this position and going now. I know it's been a while coming, so really excited. Great having you too, Bill. Thanks for joining. Uh, we have Emmett Wilson. Emmett Wilson's my son, sorry. He was using my Zoom last. Hi, I'm Sarah Clark, owner of Kudu Creative. Uh, we're a design branding firm in the West Ward. Um, uh, so I guess we, 
the reason why we're here and want to be a part of this is uh, probably most aligns with what Bill was saying is the walkability and accessibility of West Ward to other outlets in the community. Um, you know, it would be great to get people able to ride a bike up to the YMCA, you know, for childcare or for our own health improvement. You know, the outcomes are, you know, the potential is amazing. Um, and I just want to see improvement because it seems like all the all the dots are there. We just need to connect them. Um, also discover and diversify modes of transportation too. So, you know, many different people have different needs and do we know them all? And how can we, you know, help everyone? Um, yeah. So, and also Tanya, uh, are you Amy's helper? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yeah, awesome. We're very excited you're here. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here too. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. And can you remind me your name again? Sorry, because I, I get a little thrown out by the name I see on screen. Oh, and I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's Sarah. S-A-R-A-H. Yep. I will remember that. Thank you very much, Sarah. Nice Great to meet you, Andrea. Yeah. Nice meeting you too. And last but not least, we have someone joining by phone. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Malia and I'm just interested because I'm a mom and I would like to see more parks and have places for my daughter to go. Wonderful, are you a resident from the West Ward? Are you a business owner? Yeah, um, I'm a, res I'm a resident. Here? Wonderful, great having you. Malia, am I saying it right? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us. Um, so I think these are all the introductions that I have. Um, and, and uh, well, I kind of already introduced myself. I'm Andrea from Colabo Planning. I am helping in the housing plan and the neighborhood plan. Um, my background is in economic development. So I have experience working with small businesses. Um, I am a long distance cyclist. So I really love everything mobility. And I really love everything paths. My favorite path is uh, the DNL that is very close to you guys. <laughs> and um, yes, so I also have extensive background in housing and it is my pleasure to be joining you guys uh, in this project. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get started. First, we're gonna go through a recap of uh, what, we're, what we're here for. So the city of Easton, in collaboration with the Housing Authority and the Greater Eastern Develop Development Partnership, uh, won a grant, a grant for a choice neighborhood plan. And what is a choice neighborhood plan? It's, it's what it sounds like. It's a plan. Uh, but under the choice neighborhood program or under the choice neighborhood uh, requirements, it's not only like a plan for housing or it's not only a plan for the neighborhood it what really makes it different is that it centers around the people so we started last year with a very 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 robust outreach effort uh, in which we were giving service out to all the residents of um, the residents in the west ward because we need to identify what the people need right um, so the effort, the survey effort ran for about six months. We surveyed, um, we handed out about more than 150 surveys. We got a hundred back. And uh, from the answers of the residents, we are starting to get an idea of uh, what are the possible areas of inter intervention. So for starters, let's, um, you guys are familiar with the West Ward. So this is a little map of our area of focus. We have about 10,000 residents in an area that is um, just about one square mile. However, it may feel really, really, really um, challenging to cover this one square mile because the topography of uh, the West Ward is, is kind of intricate, right? So uh, we are here to talk about mobility challenges. We are here to talk about transportation solutions and what is the current status of open space. We are here to talk about uh, potential opportunities. And uh, we're also here to listen to residents, to people who work here, what are the challenges that they face every day. Um, so the planning process right now, we are right in the middle 
Um, but the planning process, like I said, it started like six months ago. It started with a listening and learning phase. It was when I started doing the survey. And you guys probably saw us out there at the uh, National Night Out event at Paxinosa. We brought an artist on site and we were talking to the residents. We were talking to the neighbors. And the artist was like live drawing uh, what the uh, residents were telling her. Um, so that's we're going to be referring to that drawing while we are on the meeting today. Then uh, by continuing to engage the residents, we uh, we went through visioning. What, what would an ideal future look like? What would the ideal outcome look like? And uh, we identify uh, potential opportunities for early action projects. Some of the initial early action projects that you have seen um, are the installation of four little free libraries in the um, public housing sites of uh, North Union, as well as on Elm Street. And uh, the Bushkill House, which is also a housing authority owned property, is gonna get a community garden as part of this early action project. So now we are in the middle of the process one moment. <laughs> so now we are in the middle of the process. We, this working group actually uh, focuses on identifying strategies, programs, and projects that would possibly drive or would be um, positive outcomes at the end of these plans. And these strategies, programs, and projects are focused around people, housing, and neighborhood elements. So um, when I show you guys the final drawing by the artists that came to uh, the National Nine Night Out, I'll show you how we divided this into categories. Um, after these working groups, we're going to refine the project. From these working groups meetings, we're going to come out uh, with recommendations that will get uh, included in the final plan. And then the city of Easton, along with the GDP, and the housing authority are going to submit the plan for uh, an application for funding for implementation. So that would be the desired outcome. So for the housing element, uh, we have three target sites. So these would be the sites that we are mostly focusing on um, like affecting change, bringing the change like to the ground on this uh, sites. However, the plan is not only exclusive to this area, the plan is for the whole neighborhood, right? So this is why everybody's participation here is valuable. So the first site we have is the North Union Street Apartments. So you guys are familiar with the intersection of Northampton and 7th Street. That's where the apartments are located and that's where our first little free library is. So the whole um, purpose of the plan is that if we have 57 apartment or uh, multifamily housing units, we are required to bring exactly 57 units back and then some. So in that way, we are ensuring that no one gets displaced. And at the same time, we are addressing the needs of the community. The next site is the Bushkill House that is located on 66 South, oh, excuse me, 66 North Locust Street. And it's a senior and disabled housing with uh, 48 apartment units. And then up on Elm Street, we have 55 units. Um, and uh, this site is located at Butler and 13. Um, so um, closer to the south-ish, west-ish part of the West Ward. So uh, right now we are, in, I, I already explained you guys, we are in the strategy uh, part of the process. So we have this working groups. Um, we identified these areas according to the desired outcomes, right? So we have a working group focused on equity and inclusion. We had another one uh, focused on community health. We are the transportation and open space group. Tonight at 6 p.m., there's the art history and culture group. And yesterday was the day dedicated to housing and business. Um, this is a picture of what it looked like uh, at National Night Out when the artist was um, drawing all of the suggestions she was getting from residents when we were out with our public engagement. And this is a picture of how we've been conducting the uh, needs assessment survey, um, just from residents on the housing sites and how we did a uh, public painting event for the uh, Little Free Libraries um, installation. So um, do we have any questions for now? Feel free to use the reactions on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. Um, 
there is an option that says reaction and you can give us a thumbs up, you can clap, you can raise your hand and that helps me facilitate uh, or that helps me if anyone wants to um, comment, uh, you're free to unmute yourselves. And um, this is where we get started, all right? So we have this uh, mural board. Um, if this was a um, live meeting, we would have a large board and we would have all of these drawings like glued on the wall and you would be able to um, put post-its on it. But unfortunately due to COVID, um, this is what we are using to facilitate the public engagement now uh, on the virtual world. So at the top of our board, we have this uh, map of our site, which I already showed before. Then we have uh, our headings uh, based on the categories that um, we are focusing with the working groups, housing and business, transportation, and open space, community health and safety, equity and inclusion, and art, history, and culture. So for today, we're gonna be focusing on the green side. The green side is uh, our heading. And uh, this right here is uh, the mind map, the drawing that the artist did when we talked to her on the National Night Out event. And uh, finally, I wanted to show you the quick data key survey takeaways uh, related to transportation on green. So from the survey that we applied to the public, these were the most important takeaways that we could just uh, get from a quick glance. Um, most of the residents indicated that transportation is the most impactful barrier to services. Uh, residents indicated that the main environmental barrier to phys physical activity is that there is nowhere to walk or exercise in the neighborhood. Additionally, 49% of residents do not drive and uh, the outdoor amenities that they would really like to see are barbecue spaces, um, parking and security and and parking and security enhancements outdoors. So just by taking this uh, really quick takeaways, we can look at what the residents said uh, on our public engagement. And um, this is what's gonna help us start our conversation. So first I'm gonna give you guys a little tour of uh, what we have here on the board. So some folks said that they would like to see bike share. They would like to see money set aside for plants. They want to have a bike day on the West Ward. They want to designate safe community routes. They want to engage kids to understand where they bike. Um, they want enhanced sign signage and awareness. They want uh, speed radars to mitigate, mitigate potential uh, traffic crashes. Um, they want to connect jobs and workforce through transportation. This looks like complaints about cars parking in bus areas. They would like to see bike lanes. Um, they, this looks like a complaint about um, angle parking. They want more frequent bus service. They want better shelters and uh, closer stops. They want uh, accessibility for people with disabilities. They want um, reduction in um, trash. They want uh, water features and water fountains, more dog parks, um, enhance the existing or fixing the existing um, playground and outdoor amenities for youth. They want programs, programs for kids. They want fitness equipment, learning, a learning component in parks and to activate parklets. Um, they want more games and just uh, more access for uh, all modes for all users. So this is just like the conversation starter. This is where I will open the floor to you guys and I'm gonna be taking notes about everything you say. Uh, yeah. Yes, hello. Uh, I'd be happy to start if you want. Absolutely, go ahead, Bob. Okay, uh, a couple of things come to mind. Again, I grew up in the West Ward, I'm very familiar with it. Um, there's one aspect of the West Ward you have to kind of, uh, I guess, 
have an understanding of and approaching it too. It really is almost two or more neighborhoods in one. Uh, the north side of town of the West Ward, uh, Easton Heights, is in many respects distinctly different from the south side of Northampton Street. Um, they're both the West Ward, but there's just a different, I don't know, a neighborhood sort of feel to them. Um, the north side does have the benefit of some uh, greater open space because of access to the Easton Cemetery, which gives you access to the Carl Sterner Trail and uh, to the Silk Mill. Uh, it also has Vanderveer Park and of course uh, the Paxanosa Playgrounds. The south side has always suffered from a lack of open space and park. Uh, Centennial is the key park to the south side of the West Ward. And uh, the state recently granted, I believe it was $100,000 to the city of Easton to uh, uh, do some renovations and expansion of the park. So that's a project that's gonna be moving forward and should uh, uh, reinvigorate the Centennial Park to some extent. That being said, there's always been a need for more open space and um, recreational opportunities on the south side of the West Ward. And um, one of the challenges that has been looked at over the years is how do you access the escarpment? Uh, it's a very steep area just south of Elm Street, but it leads down to Lehigh Drive and the Lehigh River. And um, if we were ever able to make that more accessible, make that more open space accessible, uh, that would help to provide in many respects the kind of access that the north side of the West Ward has to the cemetery and the Carl Sterner Trail as far as access to river and, or creek and, and uh, open space. Um, in terms of uh, transportation, um, I noticed that the, the survey pointed out that um, uh, the residents do want more frequent bus service. And that's been an ongoing challenge for Lanta or Lehigh and Northampton Transportation Authority. Uh, typically the most frequent you get, frequency you get in terms of bus routes is about once every 30 minutes. So that's not a very good timing in terms of getting to and from work, uh, taking care of chores, going to the supermarket or whatever, or even the hospital. Uh, that being said, uh, the West Ward is served by two main bus routes, one that goes primarily up Northampton Street and the other that goes uh, out along the uh, Lehigh uh, Washington Street corridor, if I remember correctly. Um, one of the things that's missing though, which might be interesting to, to approach Lanta about, is the idea of having a loop route through the West Ward. Um, something akin to the trolley service that's uh, provided through uh, funding from the Economic Development Department of the county uh, for major events in Easton and also on market days to get people from the West Ward and other areas down to the, the farmer's market. Um, a loop could conceivably um, provide a, a route that would be more north-south focused uh, to kind of connect the two halves of the West Ward, also providing access to the Carl Sterner Trail, possibly the YMCA, uh, the Silk Mill uh, Center, uh, which has obviously been a great revitalization effort, but is kind of off by itself. Um, and uh, again, possibly into the downtown too, to access uh, businesses, goods and services and farmer market days uh, as well. Um, and that's something that we might want to explore with Lanta and maybe from a funding source with the county through its economic development monies. Um, it would be nice to kind of connect the two halves of the West Ward and provide another alternative route um, additional stops might include access to grocery stores like the Giant Plaza uh, up in Forks Township, um, things of that nature to help the neighborhood have um, greater access to the kind of goods and services and employment opportunities they need. Uh, as the survey pointed out, 49% of the residents don't drive. So mass transit, uh, alternative forms of transportation such as biking and uh, walking accessibility are very critical uh, to the circulation in the West Ward and also to the success of residents to, to access the things they need. Um, those are just a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, one other aspect about open space, uh, we do have a number of pocket parks uh, in the West Ward. Uh, many of them are former um, houses that came down because they were blighted and they were turned into uh, pocket parks in the 70s, 80s and 90s. Uh, they have been kind of underutilized and it's been a challenge for the city to determine how to best um, use them. Um, but that's something we probably will need to look at too, is how to incorporate that into any kind of open space uh, plan and to better utilize them as a recreation or even just a, a visual green space to enliven the, uh, the open space, green space aspects to the neighborhood. Just some thoughts. Absolutely. All, all of what you're saying sounds very, very spot on and very, very like 
accurate. Um, we have a comment here from uh, from someone at the event who said activate parklets and it's exactly what you were saying. So um, I feel like uh, this is also an opportunity to hear from uh, other attendees. Um, do you guys have comments regarding activating parks or uh, we can continue um, discussing public transit? Uh, yeah, Andrea, I can have some th thoughts. I think with the parklets, you know, I think one of the things that um, I constantly think about whenever I'm working on mobility projects is that it needs to be user driven. And I think the parklets is a case where the city was like, okay, well, we have these lots, we'll make them parks. Oh, people didn't come, but there was no thought that, you know, the people weren't there or people didn't want parks there or need parks, especially there. And so I, I think we can, uh, you know, maybe raise the profile of those and make them a little more amenable to people, but it's, it, we sort of did it backwards there. It was like, we have this space, you better come here and use it rather than where, where do you wanna be or where are people gathering? Let's create things there for people. Uh, I, I think there's some real physical um, barriers that we need to confront there. One, you know, as Bob brought up, it's just really criminal that there's no access down the escarpment to one of the greatest trails in the state and really in the country the DNL, you, you know, you look at certain parts of the West Ward and they're, you know, they're literally two blocks from the DNL trail and they can't access it. They would have to walk or ride, you know, a mile and a half or two miles to get to an access point. That's something I think is absolutely critical to fix physically. Um, when people are talking about, I think I was really happy to see add bike lanes on there and safe community routes and some other things, because as we've seen more and more in as mobility, science has um, been refined. It really is about infrastructure. It's not about um, putting share the road signs. It's not about sharrows. Those things are um, kind of useless. It, we really do need to go in there and figure out ways to lower speed limits where it needs, needs to be lowered that aren't about signs or radars, but are about speed bumps or narrowing roads. And we need we do need um, designated bike lanes at the least marked off with paint at at the at the best physically separated. Um, there is a separate plan right now a proposal to make a bike lane from on Northampton Street that would be both ways that goes from 15th Street to downtown. You know that's just something for us to consider. There is currently a plan for that. Uh, there's, yeah, the, a study was done and it is, um, I know it's, it's with, you know, Dave Hopkins, uh, the, uh, one of the city, um, city planner, uh, he, you know, he's, he wants to try to push this forward. So it's just something for us to keep in mind. It's nothing we could do in this committee or as part of the Westward project. I don't think, um, they're looking for grants right okay. now. Uh, and the, and the other thing is just getting, you know, as those physical things start to happen, uh, you know, I, I also thought it was interesting that Bob brought up the cemetery because it is a great open space. It's that old style um, romantic cemetery with tons of trees and open space and great terrain. And it's really underused by the community. And I think that's because it feels far away. You know, as when you pointed out the, the whole West Ward is a mile, it's just a mile square. That's really, uh, you know, in, in big cities, people will walk a mile and a half without thinking anything about it. When you're in the West Ward, it can feel, uh, it's just unfriendly to walk, right? And so going from the south side of West Ward to the cemetery feels like a longer walk and it's just not a great walk and it's not friendly and you don't see other, you know, there's not a lot of other users out walking. So I think there's a kind of a psychological and informational barrier to get into the to the cemetery and using that um, for a lot of residents and, and similarly, I, I I think just the more you know studies studies have shown that one of the key factors in mobility, walking or riding, is users. When the more users, uh, you know, like uh, oddly, as more people ride, it becomes safer to ride. That's correct. Um, right, and and you know, same with walking and. I think if we could help set up um, safe routes to schools and there are other national programs that we could tap into and copy 
um, where, you know, there are like bike trains where all the kids will, um, you know, go through the neighborhood and ride to the school. And so I think those kind of informational and, and um, psychological programs will be just as important as some of the physical ones. Definitely. Absolutely. I, I really like, I, I strongly agree with everything you said. And I really like that someone here said like a Westward bike day. I have seen uh, events in, in many cities that is like bike to work day or bike to school day. Um, I don't know if we have anyone here from a public school or from um, business. Um, do you guys think that having a bike to work day uh, twice a year or bike to school day twice a year would be like a, I, I don't know, it's a, it feels like a low, low stakes introduction event. You, we, I mean, we, I, the bi bicycling would uh, happily like two or three times a year through the school year, help host and organize a, a bike to work day where we would, you know, literally go around the neighborhood and pick up kids uh, as, as, you know, and so we're riding in a group to school. That would be fantastic. Great. Awesome. Yeah. And I, also to add to that, the neighborhood night out would be a great opportunity to give children and family access to maybe certain bike materials that they don't have that they need for safety, whether it be helmets or um, any sort of like padding or gear of any sort. I think that would be also reinforce the idea of, hey, we have trails, you know, get out and try them and something that happens more than twice a year. The more intersections we have to the community to celebrate um, other modes of transportation and allowing accessibility to it, I think the better. Um, also benches. I don't see benches on the list. <laughs> it's add benches. Um, <laughs> is it? No, no, I'm adding it right now. Yeah, so there is, um, I'm on 7th and Wood Avenue and one of the bus stops, the major bus stops is right um, in front of the armory. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's very busy, it's well used and there's these big cement Jersey walls there that people are sitting on. And in the winter time it's cold and it's just not enough for as many people that use that route. Um, too. So just a nicer, nicer waiting area. Like if we're moving, we should be, you know, sitting too if we want. Um, yeah. And then also one other thing, Community Bike Works is now in the West Ward. I think um, I really like their program of build a bike. Um, and I think that, again, is another opportunity to help children um, access bikes and get interested and get curious. Um, one of my boys' scout buds did the, did the shop over the summer, and he said he really, really liked it. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity, great introduction, um, wonderful education, too. That would be a good addition, so. Wonderful. Yes, yes, like uh, having this, like a summer pro summer program or or having opportunities for youth engagement around like outdoor recreation like cycling uh i think that they are really effective they really i don't know i i am a big fan of them as a follow-up point to sarah's point about the the benches too at one time lanta the transportation authority used to have shelters and benches along uh, some of the major bus routes particularly the northampton street route and for one reason or another, they were removed. I don't know if it was a maintenance issue or, or what. But I think that really points to the fact that we, as a group, should maybe um, set up a meeting with Lanta to see if we can have some of the transportation issues looked at, addressed, and if we can collaborate with them. Uh, they are a separate authority funded by the two counties. But uh, they seem to be very receptive to uh, public input. And I think getting them engaged in our plans would be helpful moving forward. So that that's a consideration. That'd be really helpful. Do you, um, I think that it's a super fantastic idea. Do you think that there would be a way um, anyone in your office could help us reach out to them? I'm sure that we already have sure. contact with, with people there, but I, I don't have the list in front of me. Um, and I think that, if it came from you and from your office, it would have more weight than if it's just like coming from a community group. 
No, I'd, I'd be happy to. In fact, after the meeting, if you want to send me an email, uh, just to remind me to have my staff uh, reach out, or I could possibly even make a phone call to the executive director. Um, my email is rfreeman at pahouse.net. One moment. And I'll, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. House.net. rfreeman at uh, pahouse.net. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, we'll be happy to reach out to them and see if they'd be, you know, open to a meeting to discuss uh, Lance's role for transportation and mobility in the West Ward. That would be amazing. Yes, yes, I love this. Thanks. Um, anyone else uh, related to um, bike lanes, back, bike access, uh, bus access and frequency or open space? I'd, I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, I, I really liked what Bill was saying about not only improving the infrastructure, but also the sort of personal um, feel to the bike lanes and biking and also bus routes in general. Um, so I live, I guess it's technically right into the West Ward, like um, on Walnut there past Sixth Street uh, by Two Rivers. Um, and I, I have a disability where I've often like lost my license. So technically right now it's suspended and I really do rely on a lot of rides. Um, and I can't tell you how many times people have told me like, don't even bother with Lanta. I've looked it up like what it would be a, a two hour bus ride back and forth or I mean, four hours back and forth to the grocery store. So I just don't even attempt. Um, and again, it's sort of a, maybe it's too personal of me, but I often feel, um, I feel like it's inaccessible or uh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable biking around the neighborhood or around town. Um, I'm just not a com like a confident cyclist. So I think uh, on a personal note, I would really get a lot from like a, um, a bike, a biking day around the West Ward and, and maybe Amy can speak more to uh, what we did at Vegetables in the Community um, a couple of years ago where Kat came in and sort of organized a children's bike day um, to ride around the neighborhood together. But uh, I'd, I'd love to see something like that or um, yeah, like a, a social event to get someone like me and others more comfortable biking around the neighborhood. Um, so I, yeah, I would, I would really like to see something like that. Um, and also I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen a study where there's a gender discrepancy between who is comfortable using bike lanes. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not well versed in it, Bill. I don't know if this is something that you're, um, you would be able to speak to more, but I could have sworn I've seen studies that say um, women are not as comfortable using bike lanes. So I just wonder if there's a specific type of person um, that's comfortable with that or specific groups of people or children that are just not as comfortable or, and what could be done infrastructure wise to make that a little easier. So anyway. Yeah, this, this is a great point. So the, um, it, it, maybe Andrea, you know this as well, women and children are um, less likely uh, to adopt and use bike lanes that aren't separated, physically separated. Uh, you know, just when someone paints a stripe down the road, because it still doesn't feel safe, right? There's still, it doesn't. Um, it, you know, there's some degree of awareness from drivers, but a, a driver can still cross. But when the, where there's a bike lane that's separated, even by um, sort of plastic bollards, you know, that's like, that's like, the, you know, the, the best designs are separated by um, actual physical barriers, um, concrete um, bollards, or there are a lot, a, a lot of success um, just moving the parking over. And so parked cars are a separation from moving cars between bikes. And then once that happens, women and children start using bike lanes. And it, that is like the indicator that there's a healthy, robust, um, personal mobility scene going on when, when, when this is, and it's fascinating when women start using um, bike lanes, every, it's, everything is good there. Right. And it's healthy and you're doing things right. So it's a, it's a great um, indicator. And it's, it's something we should aspire to. Really glad you brought that up. 
wonderful, great, great, great comments here. Thank you so much for your input, Bill. And thanks so much for uh, opening up about your uh, vulnerability, Miranda, and uh, really pointing out how the deficiencies in the uh, public transit system are actually hindering development opportunities for the most vulnerable residents, and that is not acceptable. Uh, so uh, Andrea, I have a couple of comments to make as well. Um, so did, there, there currently is no bus that uh, goes by the YMCA. Um, and so if you could include that um, when you get an audience with Lynch, I think that would be really amazing. So um, for many reasons for residents to the West Ward, you know, one of the uh, asks I think is for camp. Um, we have a camp, we have financial assistance available uh, to those residents, so we could certainly be meeting that need. Um, employment, I would, we just are so in need of staff here. Um, and so if folks were looking for job, it, it would be relatively close to home if they could get here, but because 49% of the residents don't drive, then um, this is uh, not a place for them unless they want to Uber every day. And we do have some employees that Uber, but that adds up. Um, also, um, uh, to, to the uh, comments about the biking, um, we do get kids that come in from the West Ward, they walk, um, but there is no safe passage necessarily, or, uh, um, you know, they, they walk on Lafayette Street, um, there is a, a wide um, shoulder, um, but, but it's not marked for, for bikers or walkers. And so perhaps adding something uh, there, traversing from 13th Street to Lafayette Street too is kind of a, a bit of a challenge because it, it takes on an incline um, right there. Um, so, uh, you know, a meeting, meeting up with kids uh, someplace and and go you know going together uh, biking to the Y where the Y staff could meet them and then you know do something from there would be really great and perhaps we could do that with Community Bike Works um, they have been using the Y as a site to do their build a bike program with great success so we're really happy to have the partnership with them um, also um, on, a, on a different note, we are in partnership with Amy and GEDP to do summer park programming very successfully at Vanderveer Park in Dutchtown Park. Um, we've also collaborated at Veggies and Community with um, Miranda and done some activities there. Um, but there's definitely room for more uh, people to participate. And so maybe if we could look at some um, different ways to um, to not have it be a secret, if you will. Um, Amy does a tremendous job at um, social media and uh, we do rely a lot on just word of mouth, the people that do come. And I think that's how we have built um, the regular participation, but certainly I think there are people out there that don't know about the opportunity that we have to figure out a different way to communicate with. Absolutely, I strongly, strongly agree. Uh, from uh, from the quick look at the uh, survey results, uh, a lot of people said that their kids don't participate in summer programs because uh, A, it's cost prohibitive, and B, like they just don't know where to send their kids. So uh, yes, I think that it's really, really, really important that we find a way of bringing this vital information to families. Well, the park programs are free. There, uh, there is no cost at all. And as I mentioned, the uh, camp program at the Y, there is financial assistance available to families. And it's quite well funded by people that believe in that experience for kids in the summer. So um, again, I just think we need to figure out how to get that word out to people. Great, awesome. Thanks for your comment, Lori. Uh, Amy, you had raised your hand. I just wanted to comment on the uh, the bike event that we held at the veggie stand a couple years ago. Obviously, it was pre COVID. Uh, we had we worked with the Coalition for Alternative Transportation or CAT for short, um, and they came in and they did bike maintenance with with kids because, you know, not everybody knows how to fix a bike. So that was 
really awesome. Um, and then they went on a big bike ride through the neighborhood and they had adults and kids participate. Also, our um, Easton police are all trained on bicycle as well. So they came along for the ride just because it was a large group. So they kept everybody together. Um, it was really awesome. And um, it, it was just like a really good night. I know we get asked constantly. Oh, we lost Andrea. Hold on. She'll be back. She said her computer was crashing. She's restarting. I'm so sorry about that. My computer crashed. I'm so happy to see that you guys are still here. I don't know what happened, but thanks everybody for your patience. We were having such a great conversation. <laughs> uh, Amy, I really apologize that you got caught off. You were about to say something and meanwhile, I bring my, my screen back on. Sure, sure. I just wanted to comment on the um the bike day that Miranda referenced from the veggies and community stand. Um, uh, we did it once and it was really uh, just a, a COVID related issue why we didn't have it again. Um, but the group from the coalition for alternative transportation came in. Um, they ran a, a bit of a, a clinic uh, earlier before they went out on a ride and helped fix problems with kiddos bikes. And they also gave out free helmets. Um, and then they took a large group. Um, I would say easily two dozen people of all ages up through adults out on a bike ride through the neighborhood. Um, all our Easton police department is chained on bike as well. So we had at least two officers join in that group run for safety reasons and, you know, to keep everybody together. Um, so it was very successful. It's, it's definitely a requested item to bring back. Uh, I know that Genesis bicycles used to do a ice cream ride. I, I think now that they're under, under new ownership, I I'm hoping they continue with that, but uh, they used to end, they used to take, you know, people of all ages out and then they would end at a bicycle or a um, ice cream shop for ice cream after the ride. And we could easily do something like that in West Ward 
Um, we've got an ice cream shop right here that I know would appreciate a bunch of folks for ice cream afterwards. So I think if we could um, get something like that going, we would get a lot of people out um, riding again. So, and that, you know, that was, that predated um, Community Bike Work. So I think they would be an excellent partner to tap into for something like this. That is awesome. I love to hear it. Thanks so much, Amy. I can talk about bike events all day. <laughs> uh, but yes, like, I, I really feel that, that uh, doing like group rides um, definitely gets people um, more confident to get out if uh, if it can be planned that it, it is a route that could end at the DNL or at the DNR trail so that people start learning that it's accessible from where they are. I think that that would serve a double purpose of not only like connecting people to outdoor recreation, but they are also learning how to get to these spots um, or doing a ride that takes them over to the cemetery uh, and right around the cemetery. And now they are familiar with how to get there. And now they are confident that, oh, I can do this. Um, it, 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 it's just a process. And then I keep hearing that there are at least three bike shops or at least three bike organizations in uh, in the area. So three bike shops within a one square mile is, is a lot of bike shops. That's really awesome. So uh, maybe it could be arranged that over the summer, once a month, one bike shop takes one event and uh, they just do it out for the community. Um, I think that it would be really cool. Uh, here in Philly, there is a Twitter group and uh, they write every other Wednesday just because they're from Twitter and there's no reason. It's just the Wednesday night rides. And uh, we have seen the group grow uh, from like only seven to 21 and we're in the middle of winter and we're still writing and uh, we were people that have never met each other just from Twitter, you know, so I really believe in the capacity building uh, opportunities that come from doing an activity together and just doing it constantly. Um, so thanks so much for that. Thanks everyone for your comments. I uh, haven't Anyone wants to jump in? Hi, um, I'd like to like make a couple comments if I can. Um, I'm sorry I, I was late this morning. No worries. Um, so I, I'm sure that you all did introductions. Um, my name is Andy Poe. Um, I'm a Easton business owner. Um, I own Second Base Vintage, which is on Northampton Street. Um, I also have a skateboard shop in Bethlehem called Home Base, and we work very closely with um, Paxinosa with our Push Ahead program, which is a program that teaches kids the basics of skateboarding um, and skateboarding safety. So it's not unlike um, Community Bike Works. Um, there's a lot about our programs that are very similar, except instead of providing kids with information and knowledge about bikes, we provide them the information about skateboards. Um, so all this conversation about bike lanes and making the um, transportation on the West Ward safer for people on bikes um, is really good news for me to hear because skateboarders can use bike lanes too, um, as long as we do it safely and we're not um, doing tricks and getting in people's way. But um, I'm a very strong proponent for all the conversation that is happening, um, all the, the things that I was able to kind of catch up on. It sounds great. It sounds like the things that I wish were in my community um, when I was a kid. So um, yeah, it's nice to see Bill on here as well. And so my comment would be um, there's talk on the on the board there in the community there was um, talk of use of open space and then there was also talk of summer programs and I think that um, those are very important for growing skateboarders so I'm always pushing for skate parks um, we got the we worked with the city of Bethlehem to get the Bethlehem skate plaza built uh, we worked with the city of Allentown um, to get the Jordan skate park built. I worked in the Forks Township to help get the small skate park in Forks built. Um, 
I would lo love nothing more to see a safe, skatable space in the West Ward um, for the kids. We know that there's kids that want to skateboard in the West Ward because when we sign, we have signups for our push ahead program at Paxinosa, which we can only serve about 10 to 12 kids per class. The waiting list is about 50 kids. So there is a demand specifically in the West Ward for kids who are very interested in skateboarding, um, which is, to me, it's awesome. I want to encourage that because skateboarding, just like riding bikes or any other outdoor physical activity, gives kids a lot of confidence in themselves. It builds their sense of resilience. It builds their sense of camaraderie. Um, it builds a great and healthy support system for the kids to be able to interact with each other and break down barriers where, you know, at the start of one class, we had a boy come to me and say, why are there girls in our class? Skateboarding is for boys. And as soon as they started skateboarding, the boy was a little bit lower on the skill level than the girls. There was girls that were skating circles around him and, but they were supportive of him. And then he didn't, you know, he didn't feel shame about what he said. He just became part of the group. Um, Amy has stopped by some of our classes. Um, we work very closely with um, Janine and Nancy at Paxinosa, and we're very happy that they've been so supportive of the program because it's really showing us um, how this can grow. And this spring, we hope to be in all three school districts in the Lehigh Valley, bringing this type of program um, to the kids. So if there's any way that um, there can be a discussion about skateboards. Um, I promise not to be too annoying about it, but um, I'm in full support of all the things that are, talk that are being said here. So thank you for having me. I love it. I love to hear it. Thank you so much, Andy. Just to make sure that I got the name of your business right, is it First Base? Um, okay, so the business in Easton is our vintage shop. So it's called Second Base Vintage. And then our primary shop in Bethlehem that we've had longer is called home base skate shop so we're a skateboarding shop with a baseball theme. <laughs> gotcha awesome yes I, I it threw me off for a minute uh so thanks so much for cl clar clarification yep. one um, a a andrea i'm a hundred percent agree with andy that one of the things we should really strive to come out of this with is a, a skate park um slash bmx park in the west ward it, because that that's talk about user driven the the demand is there and they become just such um, community um, centers for you know kids but also the parents and I, I, I think there are lots and areas where we could do it and I'm a really big believer in this uh, to the extent that there was talk at one point of a BMX park downtown and I was pretty strongly against that because I didn't think that's where the kids were. I think we put it right where the kids are. There's, there's also been talk about putting one at Hugh Moore Park, but kids, they're not going to, they're never going to get there, right? If you're depending on your parents to drive you yeah. to the skate park or the BMX park, it's going to be harder to get there. So let I, uh, we should absolutely do this. And also just want to mention that Andy's one of the most stylish men in the Lehigh Valley, according to <laughs> Lehigh Valley stuff. Awesome. Hey, Bill, just a, just a question, Bill. Um, oops. Sorry. Okay, there we go. A question about how much uh, space would you need for a decent skate park BMX bike park? Yeah, Andy, he, he's he's oh. built two of them, so three of them. Okay. Uh, so to answer that question, um, skate parks and BMX parks can be of any size. I mean, gr um, traveling the country and traveling the world to skate. I mean, sometimes you'll run into parks that are no bigger than a basketball court but because they use the space correctly um, a lot of you get a lot of users in a small square footage um, parks like the one in Bethlehem or the one that's um, in Allentown I mean those are parks that can be built because the space is available now in cities I think like with Easton space is a little bit more um, of a precious commodity um, but there's always flexibility. Like the park in Bethlehem is very unconventional. It's just a very long strip of land, but it's super narrow and there's not very many parks. So it almost works like a walking path. So we had to design it where the obstacles kind of flowed linearly instead of circularly. 
which is traditional to skate parks, um, they don't have to be big. I think right now there's a trend where there's cities that are trying to outdo the, each other where they're used, the biggest skate park used to be in Oregon and now it's in Texas. And now somebody else in California is trying to build one that's the size of three football fields, which is currently being built. And you don't really need that. I think that it's great, but it's almost kind of just, it's, it's uncalled for. Easton, I think, is a perfect place where you can show how pocket parks can be more effective. So you can have a smaller skatable space in each neighborhood that offers a different experience to the kids. Um, there's some of the most popular places in the city aren't built for skateboarding. It's just very architecturally focused. You can just have sculptures that are just architecturally driven and that's gonna gather BMXers and skaters to it just because they wanna skate the angles or the curvatures of that art. Um, I mean, so there's a lot of flexibility. It's not just a skate park has to be this right angle, this curve and this box thing and that's it. I think that cities can get very, like if a city is very artistic like Easton, you can bring that, um, that personality into these types of parks and create structures that are very architecturally pleasing, something that fits into a neighborhood, something that doesn't look too like crazy. And um, like I said, in Bethlehem, when we were pr proposing the Bethlehem Skate Plaza, if skateboarding or BMXing ever faded away, you would have a structure there that could be repurposed just for community use with some minor tweaks. So mm -hmm. lots of flexibility. Sounds like it. Yeah, I was just wondering, and, and Amy, maybe I should direct this to you. Would there be any chance as we move forward with the um, renovation of Vanderveer Park to possibly incorporate a skate park element? Um, if you'd like to come pitch that idea to the school district, Bob, with us, I okay. yeah, think, uh, yeah, I think uh, um, the liability piece always comes up. And since that is school district property, um, I don't know what their take on it would be. I know they are also looking at as looking at it as an extension of Paxo, Paxinos's backyard. So space that would be usable for the kiddos during the day too. Right. Um, but I think that there's other, uh, there are other park opportunities too here. Like Andy has mentioned, you know, there's really, we can tailor it to the size of space. Um, right. So I think that there's some other opportunities as well if Vandeveer wasn't an option. Um, I, I thought Vandeveer was you have a built-in audience with the kids already there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Draw for the neighborhood and hopefully uh, maybe for some supervision because it would be a school district property. They might take better care of overlooking what goes on. Um, but to Andy's point about other spaces, maybe even something along the Carl Sterner Trail might uh, provide an opportunity for a smaller art-based kind of skate, skate park as well. Yeah. Just some thought. Yeah, that'd be awesome to see. I just wanted to, um, Andy, I love hearing you talk about the skate park. You know, I'm a big proponent of it because I see it here in the neighborhood. Um, that's kind of, when I first moved here, there were two kids, neighbors that they were out, you know, all you heard was just the skateboard clicking all night as they were practicing tricks. And they were, they were so quiet, except you just hear the skateboard. And um, so it has like a really near and dear place to my heart. I love it. Um, and I, uh, to Bill's point about, you know, building space for, for how people use it, you are so spot on. And I think mm -hmm. skate parks also appeal to a large audience in age wise. We always talk about how do you, how do you program for kids that are 12 and older and, and start getting into teenage years? Like it's really, it's difficult and it's difficult to find places that they can be and that they want to be and that they're allowed to be. Um, and I feel like this starts to fit some of those bills too, and could be really great for, for kids as they start to get older as well. So, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I would, de I definitely find myself being at a skate park, being one of the older people there, and then talking to somebody who is like half my age and asking like, how do you do that trick? Mm -hmm. And they're teaching me what to do, but what's great. I mean, we see it all the time where um, 
people who stopped skateboarding ended up going, getting jobs, having families, their kids are now skateboarding and that brings the parents in. So it's not, it's not like when you go to a skate park, it's all a bunch of like 13, 14, 15 year olds. It is a, a very diverse group of people doing, you know, riding skateboards, riding scooters, riding bikes. And, um, and then you have people of all different backgrounds, all different ages, all interacting in the same space. And inherently these cultures, these sports are very, um, they're not competitive um, as much. You can build a very positive environment if you know, it's tied to the community. Now, if you, if you build a skate park in the corner of town and you leave it in the middle of nowhere, very, there's gonna be certain activities that are gonna happen if the community's not involved, but if the community stays involved and it's like the West Ward has a great um, structure to it of a support system that could be a place where it just fosters a very positive um, a very positive energy for everybody to get out get using it kind of like it was said um, about the the bike the why the bike days are such a great idea is it because it builds if more people are using it more people have the confidence to say like well if they're doing it like I can do it too and they join the group I think skate parks um, do that just as much. Wonderful. I strongly, strongly, strongly agree. Thanks so much for your comments, Andrew. Andrew. Um, so I would like to um, touch on two uh, items that we haven't talked about, and uh, they are uh, kind of like hot button issue in uh, other areas. So parking. Uh, I, I have heard all types of complaints about parking, people that have multiple cars and uh, they claim uh, street parking as if it were their own. And uh, uh, I hear that uh, parking uh, fights or par parking wars is creating an unsafe environment. Uh, have you guys experienced that in the residential areas or in your business areas? Or maybe there's a lack or there's an overabundance of parking and now it feels like the area is um, too uh, vacant because it's just a lot of parking and no one parks there or the opposite. Uh, I wanna hear what, what about a uh, parking situation? Parking has always been a key issue in the West Ward, uh, even when I was a kid. Um, it, the West Ward went through a transformation. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, it was a mix of housing where there was some apartment, but a lot of uh, family owned homes. And so you didn't have quite the density that you do now because of the fact that many homes have been converted to apartments uh, or there's just a greater number of apartments than there used to be. Plus in a very auto bound society that we're in, uh, almost everyone in the family who's of driving age needs a car to access work or activities. So the problem of parking has accentuated over the years in the West Ward. Um, it's, it's a tough nut to crack, it really is. Uh, I've always thought there might be some opportunities uh, to look for some vacant lots or uh, even back alley access points where the city could have uh, smaller scale parking garages or lots that would not be intrusive. Uh, one of the things about parking lots I think you wanna be careful with is you don't wanna create these wide open um, windswept spaces in a dense residential neighborhood. It kind of destroys the integrity of the, of the neighborhood. But if you put them off of service alleys in the center of blocks, you can still address the parking issue without uh, destroying the streetscape. Um, but yeah, it's an ongoing issue. Great, thank you very much. Anyone else wants to comment on parking? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I go back to that stat that 49% of the residents don't drive. I'm, I'm just, you know, it's interesting to lay that over what Bob was saying. And I, I think there should probably should be just a more, and then there, there may be a sort of more in-depth, intensive look at the parking. And I'll bet it's, if there are problems, I'll bet it's isolated in certain areas of the West Ward and we could identify those. Also, I just wanted to say that I think that 49% figure is an opportunity. It's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. Um, there are a lot of neighborhoods where, you know, like 95% of the residents drive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is, so this is a real, this is not a car centric um, neighborhood. I, I think that's 
important for us to keep in mind and a great opportunity to create something really livable. It really does beg the question of how can you promote more alternative forms of transportation too, whether it's better bus service, whether it's biking, whether it's pedestrian friendly. Uh, that's that's a key focus. Absolutely. I love that. That sounds great. Um, how about uh, the second issue, uh, hot button issue I want to talk about is litter. Um, how has the trash collection been? Have you guys experienced any interruptions with the trash collection during the pandemic? Um, do you guys have a illegal dumping uh, problem? Mm, I, I, I don't know. So this is where, where I open the floor to you guys. I think one of the aspects to that, and maybe Amy could speak to this to some extent, um, mm -hmm. the West Ward is slowly benefiting from trying to get the ambassadors program into parts of the West Ward to help with the kind of clean look and, and, and making sure that litter doesn't dominate the streets because that sends a, a bad message to everyone in the neighborhood that the neighborhood is not doing well. Um, I don't think there's been an overall problem with municipal tracks collection. And Amy, maybe you have a different experience. But I think that's been by and large okay. They also do a decent job of collecting recycling. But in the neighborhoods themselves, the neighborhood parts of the West Ward, uh, there can be spots where there's litter. You know, uh, kids walking by just drop, you know, various things in the street or the sidewalk. Um, and I think maybe beefing up the ambassador element that the city uh, or GEDP operates into the West Ward would help two days. Uh, Anthony from Connections is part of a group that goes out and tries to clean up neighborhoods on certain Saturdays with volunteers, uh, and they've been uh, very prominent in that effort. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's a concerted effort on a, a number of fronts. Okay, absolutely. Amy, do, do you agree with that or have any thoughts? Yeah, um, uh, on a couple things. Uh, the ambassadors are um, in West Ward. They've, they've run a pilot program and then to a more uh, uh, stable territory over the last five years. Um, this year, we're actually uh, changing that, that territory around so that they will be on Northampton Street from 6th to 13th Street, as opposed to within the neighborhood. They had focused on Ferry Street and Walnut Street in the past. Um, and we, we really see Northampton Street as a gateway. Obviously, it's, it's heavily traveled um, it, and litter is a big issue. Um, it's not so much, you know, big garbage that, that is out. It's your candy wrappers, your potato chip wrappers, your, you know, soda cans and so on and so forth. And um, so that's, that's, that's been definitely a big issue throughout the neighborhood. And it, it takes... Um, if we had all the money in the world and all hires in the world, we could definitely uh, have the ambassadors help that. But we also need to educate people that the trash winds up in our rivers. Um, it, you know, it's it's pollution. It's not recycled. On top of that, for those items, um, so we really need to take an environmental look at things too. Um, our clean and safe committee is working on a clean streets uh, campaign that we hope to kick off this year, and then piggyback it with the citywide cleanup day at the end of April and try and do more clean efforts throughout the neighborhood and try and get people educated on both picking up in front of their properties that even though it isn't your trash, you should still clean up in front of your house. Uh, and also just trying to get people to use a trash can instead uh, and really make that extra effort. So I would say trash is, is definitely an issue. And I think a lot of it is it sits because nobody picks it up too. So it, it, it then it continues to multiply. Uh, regarding municipal uh, trash, yeah, we, we have not had any issues. I, I know they're sporadically, um, you know, a, a truck will break down, but usually they come the next day and pick up or, or they're a day or two behind, or, you know, it's, it's no more than a week off. So, they're, they're definitely very good about that. We're lucky that we have a uh, single stream recycling. And so that makes things a lot easier and we take a, a wide breadth of uh, recyclables too, so. Two points in, in a follow-up to Amy's comments. 
Uh, there might be a need to assess whether there needs to be more public trash receptacles in the West Ward. Um, you know, kids are going to drop stuff. There's no place to put it. And maybe if there's a strategically placed uh, trash receptacles around the West Ward uh, on major thoroughfares, uh, pedestrian thoroughfares, that might help to reduce um, reduce some of the, 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 the litter that occurs. Uh, the other is the issue of dumping, which, which Andrea uh, talked about. And uh, again, Amy, I'll defer to you, but I think the, the biggest areas of possible dumping have been more excluded parts of the West Ward, uh, the escarpment, um, maybe along the Carl Sterner Trail and certain isolated areas uh, where it's easier to dump stuff, uh, and maybe some back alleys uh, in the West Ward. But I mean, correct me, I don't think there's a widespread dumping problem anymore. There's not, but you will, um, you do get it. And people also leave it on the street, the yeah. street, like um, it, it, it feels like it's people who don't live here that come and drop it here because they think it will be picked up. Yeah. Um, I know I had a gentleman tell me that he had a foosball table dropped in front of his rental property as trash, like on a random day too. So uh, I have had, you usually find furniture like that. I know for a while there was, uh, it just seemed like there were constantly random um, uh, sofas on the corner of 10th and Ferry Street that somebody would dump there. Uh, and obviously when somebody sees one, then it begets others too. Yeah, it does. Um, Bob, I wanted to ask you, I believe I saw something that Governor Wolf was offering that were smaller trash cans for people to put like almost on their fence or on the front stoop. Um, mm -hmm. the, one of the problems that we have with city trash cans is that the city doesn't have the manpower to constantly empty trash cans. So they are, I mean, it, there are trash cans in strategic places close to corner markets and things like that, or, or by bus stops, but they are not, once you get into, you know, the more den residentially dense areas, especially over on the north side, it, you know, they're very few and far between over there. But I wondered if those smaller trash cans, um, I believe Governor Wolf had them through a, a larger litter campaign that he just announced would be an alternative to that. I know some of my neighbors here actually leave tra trash cans closer to the sidewalk so that they become a public trash can um, and for that reason. Um, I'm not aware of the program, but if, after the meeting, if you want to send me a, an email, Amy, regarding that, I can have someone on my staff look into whether there's funding or what the administration's promoting. Um, Thanks, Bob. One, one element to the trash too, which has to be touched on, because it is a problem in certain parts of the West Ward, many mm -hmm. parts of the West Ward, is people not picking up after their dogs. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of litter that ends up dog litter uh, that's in pedestrian areas, which only makes walking through parts of the West Ward rather precarious. And it's just unsanitary. It's, there's got to be some greater enforcement of that, because it's, it's illegal to not pick up after your dog. But a lot of people just ignore that. And it's it's an ongoing problem in certain pedestrian pathways of the West Ward. And also, uh, thanks so much for pointing this out. Obviously, if there is a big drawing of a dog here, it means that probably a lot of people complain about the same thing. Um, so I think that along with dumping, although you mentioned that dumping is, is localized in faraway areas, I feel like it's the kind of thing that you you would want to address as soon as possible because you don't want it to get worse. Uh, so same with the dog uh, litter, like definitely, I think that that there's, we shouldn't be delaying in correcting these problems. And uh, definitely we, we have to include this in like what our walkability strategy, uh, if, if that's what we're gonna call it. So thanks everybody for your comments. We are on the last uh, five-ish minutes of the presentation. Uh, I just wanna tell you guys what uh, the next steps are and uh, open it up for final questions. So look at our map with the green one. I think that we did a real, real, real wonderful job on um, talking about all the issues out here. Did anyone have an additional issue that is not reflected right here and uh, you guys wanna bring it up for our next conversation?
Great. So then what's happening next is that uh, we're going to have our next meeting next month. Uh, you guys sign up. Um, sorry, the working groups meet once a month for the next three months. So our next meeting is going to be in February. Um, and I will give you the exact date in a minute. Um, but then for our next meeting, what we're going to do is we're going to sort through all of this um, sort through all of these ideas, sort through all of these recommendations, strategies and programs and projects, and we're gonna start prioritizing them. So uh, we're gonna talk about who will benefit from them, what could their intended and un unintended consequences be. And then we're gonna brainstorm how to bring people to the table um, to make them happen. And then the last meeting is actually like, how, how do we embed this as part of the plan in hopes that it becomes like, um, implementable, right? Um, so stay tuned for uh, the next meeting. And if you guys give me one minute, I will tell you the, the date. It is going to be Thursday, February 24th at 9 a.m. Please save the date. And uh, without further ado, I think that we made it. Um, anyone else wanted uh, closing remarks? Thanks, Sarah, for your comment on the chat. Uh, it was really great having all of you. And I think that we can um, adjourn this meeting and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye, great seeing you. Bye, thank you.